a scientist at the Royal Marsden Hospital uh, working on the use of machine learning or artificial intelligence on diagnosing or analyzing uh, MRI scans and looking for cancer. Um, Theo, for, previous to that, worked in the guise in St. Thomas's on MRI physics, looking at the MRI uh, physics itself. Um, and for the benefit of those in the earlier stage in their education, um, Theo also did a, a clinical science training with the NHS, from which he gained a Master's of Science in Medical Physics, and that was from King's College. And prior to that, he did an undergrad, ma undergraduate master's course at uh, Imperial College in London in um, biomedical engineering. To get there, he did in his A-levels, just so you know, uh, physics, chemistry, maths and maths, but don't let that put you off. Um, it's a fairly you know, STEM-orientated subject. He didn't do biology, interestingly, but I'm sure he picked that, picked that up as he went along. So I'd like to introduce Theo Balfour, who will uh, talk to you about artificial intelligence. Okay, thank you for showing up. It's good to see a lot of people. So I'm here to talk about artificial intelligence. Um, specifically, let's uh, see if this works. No. <laughs> Wrong button. There we are. So what am I going to talk about? So we're going to start off with a very quick definition of artificial intelligence. Then we're going to focus for about 15 minutes on the history of where AI comes from. Uh, how does AI work? Then we're going to move on to the current state of the art of artificial intelligence. <laughs> and talk a little bit about where we might be headed in the future. So first of all, what do we mean by artificial intelligence? Well, quite simply, as um, is defined here, the science of making machines do things that would require intelligence if done by men. And so this is a quote from Marvin Minsky in 1968. Just checking the camera, I think. It's got record on it. Good, good, good. That's right. Just checking. Thanks. And so you can see this is quite a simple definition. It's a system which appears to do something intelligent, and that gives us a very broad scope to work in. So, a brief history. So, first of all, let's talk about where computers came from. So, this is Charles Babbage, and he is credited with designing the first general purpose computer, all the way back in 1837. Now, this unfortunately wasn't completely built, although this part was, so this is the CPU, and this is a fully mechanical computer, and it's the first computer which was shown to be Turing complete, even though Turing himself wasn't born for another 100 years or didn't work on his theory for another 100 years. Ada Lovelace um, is known as the first programmer. She actually wrote code to calculate Bernoulli's number on this mechanical machine. And so this is the first true computer, although unfortunately it was never fully built. Moving on a bit to the still in the 19th century, um, we have Sam Butler, who, looking at Darwin's theories and looking at the mechanisation of the world around him, came up with some rather startling conclusions, was that we are headed to doom, essentially, and that if we don't stop the mechanisation of the world around us, we're going to end up creating machines which are more powerful than ourselves. And in fact, he implored the world to destroy every machine to try and stop this impending doom. <laughs> Suffice to say, we didn't listen at all, and by 1951, the first general purpose, commercially available computer was built. And so when I say general purpose, what I mean by this is it can be programmed to do a variety of tasks. So you can feed in code and get it to perform any number of tasks, and it gives you an output. So this is a very basic computer. To put it in you know, perspective to today's computers, this had a 100 kilohertz processor. Today we're looking about 4 or 5 gigahertz, so um, a few orders of magnitude difference there. 1.2 kilobytes of operating memory. Um, took paper tape as the input. It did have a keyboard input, but you couldn't type in things directly. Everything had to be through a code. And it weighed about 10,000 pounds. <laughs> and so this, this computer you could think of as probably being less powerful than the average calculator these days. So we've come a long way. So, Alan Turing, he's a very important and famous person in the history of computing, and he quite famously came up with the Turing test in 1950. So he'd been working on computers and the theory of computation for a while, and he theorised that machines could think, and if we wanted to check if machines could think, we could come up with a very simple test. And the simple test is that if we have an agent or a person, C, 
who is talking to a human and a computer, if he's not able to tell the difference through simple discourse or written communication, then that computer can be thought of as passing the Turing test. So it's a very simple way to tell if a computer is intelligent. Now, this isn't a complete test, and we'll talk a little bit about the limitations later on, but to be thinking of this sort of thing back in 1950 is quite impressive. So, where was the birth of AI? The first time the, first time the term artificial intelligence was spoken, or was used formally, uh, it was used first mentioned by John McCarthy, uh, in relation to the Dartmouth Workshop, which is in New Hampshire in 1956. And so this was a two-month um, conference or workshop uh, where they brought to together the best ten minds in artificial intelligence to try and come up with uses for it. And this very much kick-started what was called the golden years, from 1956 to 1974. So DARPA was created in 1958 by President Eisenhower in response to the Soviets launching Sputnik into space, and it quite quickly um, poured money into the promise of artificial intelligence. The first international conference was held in the UK, the National Physics Laboratory in Kennedy, the same year as DARPA was created. And quite critically for what I'm going to be talking about later, Frank Rosenblatt, who was actually a biologist, developed the idea of a perceptron. And we'll talk about that later on. So, continuing with the golden years, this is Eliza, the first chatbot ever designed. So this is 1966, and the point of this chatbot, designed by Joseph Weizenbaum, was to act like a psychotherapist. And so you can see, if you read some of the text here, essentially what it's doing is it's taking an input from the human user and just turning it into a question. So, pretty, you can think of how uh, maybe some psychotherapists do these days, um, just flipping everything around into a question. And it's quite interesting to see how this simple chatbot was received, because at the time, when people started interacting with it, they actually truly thought it was intelligent. And Joseph Weizenbaum really had to put a lot of effort into convincing people that this is in fact not an intelligent creature or intelligent system but rather just a very simple way, or simple algorithm, which flips the thing said to it into a question. Okay, so moving on a little bit with the golden years. These are some predictions from the 60s. It's um, so quite a long time ago. And so Herbert Simon said machines will be capable within 20 years of doing any work a man can do. So that was 1965, and we can clearly see that hasn't quite happened. And so the reason I bring these up is I think it's important when we think about where we are today to look back at history and see what people thought in those times about similar advances. So in 1970, three to eight years, we'll have a machine with the general intelligence of a human being. Again, I think you can appreciate that it didn't quite happen. Um, and that hype, that expectation, quite quickly ran into what we call the first AI winter. So the expectations just simply didn't meet, or the, the results didn't meet the expectations, massively overinflated expectations. Um, in particular, the Lighthill report in the UK, which is a report done by the government, essentially said that all of the expectations had failed to produce the intended results. DARPA cancelled the funding. Um, end of connectionism. Well, what, what do I mean there? So I talked a little bit about the perceptron, and we'll talk more about that later, but effectively, uh, people gave off the idea of trying to produce neural nets. Um, but mainly the big issue was computing power just wasn't there. So low memory, slow processes, and also strong focus on what's called here semantic logic. So what do I mean by that? So essentially you've got two different ways you can do try and implement artificial intelligence. And one of the ways that was tried a lot during this era was trying to program in direct logic. So we have logic as human beings, we engage with activities in our life using a degree of logic or common sense. And they thought back in those days that you could program a computer with this logic to get it to do intelligent things. And in the end, it turned out it just wasn't possible. It's amazing how much knowledge or information a system requires to be able to make any sort of intelligent decision and trying to program in these things as direct rules just didn't work. Um, but after that AI winter, there was another boom, and this is the age of what are called the expert systems. So these are systems which have been engineered to um, 
absorb expert knowledge from experts, as you might guess, uh, and then you can ask this system questions, whether about medical diagnoses or financial situations. Um, and this was very much a boom at the time. Japan invested nearly a billion dollars into it, which is a lot of money back in those days, and the UK followed suit quite quickly with 350 million. Neuron nets saw a resurgence. So connectionism simply means that there's very, well, we'll go on to exactly how we define neural nets because that's one of the focuses of this talk. But this was revived during this time. And back propagation, which is a way of training these neural networks, um, was described during this time. But again, it was another AI winter. So you can see there's a bit of a theme. There's a bit of a commonality <laughs> coming here, general, you know, <clears throat> happening here. There's the boom, and then they quite quick, quickly realize that it's not going to happen quite the way they imagined. So expert systems didn't turn out to be all that great, and they fell prey to the qualification problem, which means trying to describe <coughs> all the prerequisites to try and to make a decision is actually quite difficult. Uh, Japan's projects, they invested an enormous amount of money into it, but it just simply didn't result in anything worthwhile. Uh, so now it brings us to the current boom, so from 1933 till the present. And so the big driving force here is actually Moore's law, which is the law that every 18 months, I think, it is you double the processing power. And so that's essentially been chugging along all this time. And we now have a situation where IM, IBM's Deep Blue, back in 1997, was 10 million times more powerful than the first computer we saw. GPUs, which is graphical processing units, were invented, and these are incredibly powerful at artificial intelligence. And we have the age of neural networks. So I'll talk a bit about these, uh, but essentially neural networks is how most of artificial intelligence is currently done. There are also other models like reinforcement learning, which is essentially an evolution type thing where you reward an agent for doing a good behavior and punish it for doing a bad behavior, and then also probabilistic models. There's many different algorithms that exist. Um, and narrow AI flourish, what I mean by this. So you can think of artificial intelligence as coming in different flavors. You can have narrow AI, which means it's intelligent at one specific task, or you can have general AI, meaning it's intelligent at a range of tasks. So humans, we'd like to think, are generally intelligent, but most algorithms we work on currently are intelligent at only one specific application. For example, IBM's Deep Blue, um, back in 1977, IBM built a computer uh, to play chess. In 1977, it beat the world champion Garry Kasparov three and a half games to two and a half, meaning it drew one of the games. This is quite narrow, and actually, it played Garry Kasparov the year before and lost 4-2, uh, 4-2 to Garry. Uh, this is the first computer ever to beat a reigning world champion, and it's also, unfortunately for Garry Kasparov, the first match he ever lost. <laughs> so he never lost to a human, and the first match he ever lost to, was to a computer. And this was a big hit for him at the time. Now, the algorithm itself wasn't all that clever. Chess is actually a surprisingly simple game. You can just map out every single possible move there is to the end of the game and calculate which is the best next move. And that's effectively what it did. And in a way, it seems a little bit unfair because a human can't possibly calculate 10 million different combinations of moves in a few seconds. And this is effectively what the computer did. Um, but we'll move on to other examples where the humans got a slightly better chance of beating a computer. One of the next big developments was IBM Watson uh, played <coughs> Jeopardy in 2011 and beat uh, two of the reigning champions, Brad Rusher and Ken Jennings. I have to admit, I don't watch you know, Jeopardy that all that much, but essentially you are asked a question, it's a question and answering show, um, and so then IBM, IBM Watson um, was programmed to answer questions. And so use natural language processing, use enormous amount of computing power. Uh, and it was trained, and it could read when it was trained, a million books a second. And effectively, it all operated on keyword search. Uh, Watson's now been repurposed for lung cancer treatment decisions. So it's good to see the technology being used for something beneficial. OK, so that was very brief uh, history. Now we're going to move on to how does artificial intelligence work? So first of all, I'm going to speak a little bit about what conventional programming is. 
And so what do I mean by conventional programming? Well, this is what most people do in programming. You essentially have a predefined set of operations for some given inputs. We're going to go through a very basic uh, example. So FizzBuzz. I don't know if anyone knows this, but apparently it's a way to help teach children about division. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and build a system. We take in a number n, and then if that n number n is divisible by 3, we're going to output fizz. If it's divisible by 5, we're going to output buzz. And if it's divisible by 3 and 5, we're going to output fizz buzz. Anything else, just output other. And you can write this quite simply in code. And so this code here, written in Python, we've got a function defined. And so this uh, percentage sign means modulus, which means divide by that number afterwards and take the <coughs> remainder. Um, and this code essentially does this defined task here. And this is quite a simple programming task. And that's what we mean by conventional programming. Uh, but we can imagine a scenario where if we took <coughs> this input image, which you might recognize this, so this is the um, photo Wildlife Photographer of the Year Award. Uh, and if we took this image, and we try to get to this output, Tibetan fox and the marmot fighting. You can imagine if you tried to program that with explicit rules, defining for what inputs and how you're going to operate on that information, how would you get from what is essentially one million pixels to a caption output like that? And this is where machine learning becomes very important. So what do I mean by machine learning? Let's start off with some quick definitions again. So we've already gone through artificial intelligence, so it's any technique that enables computers to mimic human behavior or intelligent human behavior. So that started back in the 1950s. We then have machine learning. So this is a subset of artificial intelligence in which the algorithm learns by examples. So we feed the computer algorithm lots and lots of data. It processes that data in a way it can learn from that data. So the difference between non-machine learning artificial intelligence methods and machine learning methods is that back in the early days they tried to program artificial intelligence with just basic rules through conventional programming and just simply didn't work and what's become really powerful these days is machine learning and then more recently deep learning so this is a machine learning technique where you don't have to give it specific features to learn of the data it can just learn directly from the data and so to uh, illustrate that point a little bit. This is a slightly confusing diagram to look at, but the po what I want to focus on here is that on the top row we're emphasizing or describing machine learning, on the bottom deep learning. So deep learning inputs the data, output is the prediction you want. In machine learning you have to do some sort of feature engineering, some manual extraction of features from the data. And So that's something to bear in mind. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. So. What I'm really excited about and what I mostly work on is what are called artificial neural networks. And so I'm hoping today to teach you how we make them and how they work. And so we're going to go through step by step, starting off with the biological neurons. So what's quite interesting about artificial intelligence or machine learning today is that we've taken a lot of inspiration from biology. So this is a neuron. You hopefully should recognize it from biology class. And so we've got the nucleus and the dendrites at one end, we've got an axon with its myelin sheath, and then we've got the axon terminal at the other end. And in a very broad sense, we can think of this as having a set of inputs and a set of outputs. And in between the inputs and the outputs, there's some sort of function, some sort of operation going on inside the um, body of the neuron. And so we can take this, we can use this form to build an artificial neuron. So we're going to start off with a neuron, which is just a blob. Again, it's going to have some inputs, just like we had before. Uh, we also are going to have an output, just one this time, just one output. Uh, but what we're going to do differently is we're going to add some weights. And so what we mean by weights is if you think of each input coming in here, and the input is essentially just a signal. It could think of it as a number and the weight that is applied to it, we're using to say how important that signal is. And so, we essentially what's going to happen is we've got the inputs here, they're going to be weighted, and then inside the neuron body itself, we're going to have a weighted sum of these, and then based on the value of that weighted sum, we're going to decide to fire an output once we get to a certain level. 
So I'll go through this in a little bit more detail. So going back to that perceptron word. So back in 1969, Minsky and Papert defined the idea of a perceptron. So essentially we've got the same thing again. We've got our input on the left uh, using the character or the letter X to define that. So we've got X1 through to Xn. We've got corresponding weights for each of these inputs, which just tells us how important those inputs are. And then a little bit of algebra here, but essentially all you do is you take x1 times it by w1, add that to x2 times w2, and this gives us some value. We then have a function, which in this case is a very simple step function. And so what does this mean? If this weighted sum here is greater than 0, then output a 1. If it's less than 0, then it just stays 0. So effectively, when this weighted sum gets above 0, the output fires. And so this is a very simple concept um, which we can use for great effect. It's a very powerful concept. So we can use that simple artificial neuron or perceptron to build what we call an artificial neural network. So we've got four what we call input neurons here with their inputs. Again, just in this case, x1 to x4. And so these are just signals. So in a computer, there'll be digital signals and they can be binary inputs or maybe it's a number like 264 or they can be negative numbers, they can be float numbers with decimal places, um, but just inputs. We then have what we're going to call a hidden layer and we'll see why it's hidden in a while. So again we have, in this case we're going to create what's called a fully connected uh, layer. So every single input maps to every single intermediary neuron. Remember these are neurons, artificial neurons. And so every single one of these connections has a weight. So each input will be mapped to each one of these intermediary neurons and each one of those connections will have a weight associated with it. And then at some point we're going to have an output. In this case we've got three outputs and again every single node or neuron in the hidden layer is mapped to the outer layer. And we're going to give this neural network a very simple task. Or well, maybe not so simple, depending on how you feel. We're going to give it a picture, or in this case, details of a flower. In this case, an iris. So we're going to put into this artificial neural network the petal length, the petal width, petal, sorry, sepal length and sepal width. And so you can see those defined here. And then what we're hoping is this neural network classifies this information, tries to sort out which flower it is, and gives us some sort of answer at the end. So let's give that a go. So we're going to put in some numbers here. And so this network's been pre-trained to learn how to classify mm -hmm. iris flowers. And it will give us some sort of output. So in this case, it's saying it's iris setosa. And it'll give you a percentage confidence of how sure it is about that classification. And so you, could, you can create this neural network, and indeed people have to take in information or numbers, metrics of the size of bits of a flower and tell you what type of flower it is. Uh, but this is a pre-trained network. We're already expecting it to know what it's doing. So how do we train neural networks? Well, as with all machine learning, um, it learns from examples. So we feed it lots and lots and lots of examples. We give it the data and then we get it to predict what the outcome is, and then we look at the difference between what the real answer was and what it predicted, and we then back-propagate that through the network. Now, back-propagation in itself is fairly complicated. We're not going to go into it, but the basic takeaway message is that you can train these neural networks by examples. You feed through the example, see what comes out at the end, see what the difference between the predictive value and the real answer is, and then back-propagate that difference to update all the weights to do with the connections in between the neurons. Okay, so I hope you're still with me. We're gonna, <laughs> okay. My head's stuck. <laughs> so we've gone through artificial neural networks. Um, and we're going to jump straight to deep learning. So here was a simple neural network. So this is a bit like the one I had drawn out on the previous slides. All you need really to focus on is we've got an input layer and we've got an output layer and there's something happening in between to do with weights and intermediary neurons. And this is what we call a simple neural network. And there are things called deep neural networks. And what makes it deep? Well, it's simply just deeper. So it's got more intermediate layers and more hidden layers. The reason they're called hidden layers, you see the input layer and the output layer, everything that happens in between 
is hidden because we don't directly interface with it. So this is deep learning, and this is one of the things which has become hugely powerful and actually revolutionized this recent boom in artificial intelligence. And it's largely being brought about by these three guys who have come up with a theory and implementation of it, and graphics cards. So uh, the ability to actually compute the enormous amount of calculations that are involved in updating all the weights in a network. So every time we pass information through one of these networks, we're doing an enormous amount of calculation. Be precise, it's matrix operations, but we don't need to worry about that. So I'm going to give a ex specific example of deep learning uh, networks, specifically something I work on which is called convolutional neural networks. And again, we're going to take our inspiration from biology. So the visual system in animals, such as ourselves, we have different parts of our visual system, different layers, so we don't need to worry about the details of the here, but it's split into a cascading uh, layer structure. And neurons inside the visual cortex will be sensitive to specific regions in our sight. So that's one thing to think about. And secondly, uh, what are called simple cells or collections of neurons in the visual cortex will be sensitive to different orientations of light, so different patterns. So you've got neurons that are sensitive to different areas and neurons that are sensitive to different patterns within those areas. And that effectively gives us the inspiration or a description of how we're going to try and build these artificially. And this is exactly what was done. So Jan LeCun in 1988 um, proposed convolutional neural networks and he originally implemented this to read postcodes off bank checks. So what is convolution? We're going to go through this quite quickly. So here is an image, and so I don't know if you can tell who that is. Can anyone guess what that's an image of? It is Abraham Lincoln. It is Abraham Lincoln. It's amazing how you can tell, even though there's about, well, there's about 10 pixels across and 15 pixels up, but you can still tell that's Lincoln, so the thing is quite impressive. Now, an image is essentially just a grid of numbers, where we've assigned a grayscale value, in this case, to each of those numbers. So that's something to bear in mind, and here are what we call filters or masks. Now these are matrices, and I think for those of you who haven't gone to university yet, matrices may be something you're not familiar with, I'm not sure, I can't remember, but just think of these as filters, they're masks. And so in this case, we've got a, a mask which is sensitive to horizontal lines. And so you can tell this because it's got positive values here. So when this lines up with a horizontal line, and it's effectively how you apply this filter, is you, say if you take this filter for example, and you put it over the image, and remember the image is just a huge grid of numbers. And we multiply each element, so for example, this will get multiplied by that, this will get multiplied by that, this will get multiplied by that, and then we add them all up to give us one final number. And so, in this case, when you, add, when you multiply a positive number by another positive number, it's going to create a bigger number. And so, this filter is sensitive to horizontal lines, we've got one that's sensitive to vertical lines, one that's sensitive to uh, lines at a 45 degree angle. And so what we do in convolution was we take one of these filters and we just move it over the image bit by bit and add up the result and put that into a new grid or output. So I hope you're still with me because that is the basis of convolutional neural networks. And so I'm going to give you a picture of a convolutional neural network and don't worry too much because the specifics of this aren't too important. But what I'm trying to demonstrate is that in artificial intelligence, we have a technique called convolutional neural networks where we can feed it images and it can, it can infer information about those images. And through several convolutional, oops, sorry, several convolutional layers and then effectively a neural network, we can get a classification. So in this case, we would hope it would predict a boat. For some reason, it's predicting bird as much as a boat. But the general idea is we've got an input of an image <coughs> We move a filter over it, we get some numbers which explain features in that image, and we can use that to build a classification model, which just tells us what's in the image. Now, the next slide looks a bit crazy, but I thought I would show it because I thought it was quite impressive if we actually dig into how these neural networks work. So here we've got a very complicated neural network designed by Google, but simply it classifies images, and every single one of these different steps there's a different layer deeper and deeper into this neural network. But what I wanted to demonstrate was that 
as you move through this neural network, you get deeper levels of abstraction. So we start off at the beginning layers simply being sensitive to edges. And so this image represents what image most excites one of the neurons in one of these first layers. And then as you move through, you start getting textures start coming up. And then we start getting patterns. And then we start getting actual parts of things. So these look almost like dog noses here. You've got flowers here. Um, and then we move on to more complicated things. We've actually got what looks to be the beginnings of dogs and um, some <coughs> eyes here, some parts of buildings here. And so as you, if you train a neural network on real images, the, as you go through that neural network, it builds layers of abstraction. What I mean by that is it starts to recognize more and more complicated patterns, combinations of patterns to build an understanding of objects. And you can use that understanding to classify things. Now, if you haven't understood all of that, don't worry, because it's not the end of the world. Um, moving on to something slightly more lighthearted, it is possible to confuse these convolutional neural networks that look at images and try and figure out classifications. So I've got a few examples of what neural networks really struggle to tell the difference between. And so here's a picture of... <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully you should be able to tell the difference between these images. We've got blueberry muffins and chihuahuas. And so we can tell the difference between these, but convolutional neural networks, at least back in the early days, would really struggle with these things. And that's because there's a lot of features which are similar. You know, an eye or a nose looks a little bit like a blueberry, and even they're in similar positions. An algorithm that's not very clever is going to struggle with that. A few other examples, we've got a sheepdog and a mop. <laughs> we have a bagel or a dog. And then one of my personal favorite, we have fried chicken or labradoodles. <laughs> and so what I want to demonstrate with this is the idea of texture. It's the idea of features within an image. And so you can see here, the fur on this dog looks a bit like fried chicken. And so if you're building an image classification model based on textures, then if the textures are similar, you're going to end up with a similar answer. Now, the artificial intelligence systems they have today actually a lot more powerful than um, the early ones, and they can tell the difference between fried chicken and a doodle, as we can also. Uh, another thing to bear in mind is that convolutional neural networks or image classification artificial intelligence systems can be sensitive. What I mean by this, we take an image of something which I wouldn't even be able to tell is a great whale, gray whale. Um, uh, and, but this network has classified it correctly, so it's saying there's a 91% <laughs> chance this is a grey whale, and apparently that's the correct answer for that fin. And we stick in a baseball. It is now classified as a great white shark. And that's slightly confusing. Why has it done that? Um, and it's very hard to dig into why these huge complicated networks with all these millions of neurons have done this. Um, there are ways to do it, but what I'm trying to emphasize here is that the computer vision systems or the image classification systems built today do have vulnerabilities, where if you give it some confusing input it hasn't seen before, it can often give the wrong output. And to sort of put that, um, to demonstrate that message a little bit more, this is a convolution neural network that's classified what is quite clearly a dog, and it's said prediction dog, We then add some sort of noise to that image. And this noise doesn't affect the image on the right-hand side at all to our eyes, but the neural network has now classified this as an ostrich, <laughs> even though it quite clearly is an ostrich. And all I'm trying to demonstrate here is that these neural networks can be incredibly good at certain tasks until you give an input which is not expecting, and then it can do something completely unpredictable. And a lot of people in this research area are working on ways to try and explain why neural networks do this. Because if you ask the neural network, network why it thinks this is a dog, it can't tell you. If you ask a human why it thinks it's a dog, hopefully you should be able to give some sort of answer of what makes that look like a dog. Well, we're not currently at the stage in science where we can fully interpret how these machine learning models or artificial intelligence models are making their decision. And this is one of the big weaknesses, but it's something a lot of people are working on. So that was some about, something about convolutional neural networks, but I'm going to talk about what are the state-of-the-art applications today. So current use cases, there are a lot of them. So I've put a few here, um, but essentially you don't have to read them all. It ranges from marketing, so recommendation engines, so what you get recommended on Amazon, 
to buy next. Uh, medical, which is the area I work in, so diagnosis or triage, deciding what to do with patients next. Uh, an interesting application I saw recently was in astrophysics or astronomy. They use <coughs> machine learning to actually try and image galaxies that are placed behind another galaxy where all the light's being bent due to gravitational lensing. Um, in film, they have physics simulations and CGI. Uh, most people unlock their phone with a picture of their face these days. You can, even, you can use your voice as a password. These are all examples of machine learning where our systems learnt features or patterns about the data. And so we're going to go through a few specific examples. So AlphaGo was a project developed by Google DeepMind. And I actually watched the Netflix documentary on this on, I think it was Saturday night, and it was very interesting. So Go is a Chinese board game from 2,500 years ago, and it's been played continuously since then. It's the oldest continuously played uh, board game in history. And the rules are fairly simple, although I've never played it myself. So, 19 by 19 grid, and the aim is to try and surround, surround as much territory as possible. So at the end of the game, you count up all the squares that are in, surrounded by white um, pieces, and all the squares that are surrounded by black pieces. Whoever's got most of the board wins. Now this game is very different from chess. So we saw IBM had a go and beat Gary Kasparov at chess, and that effectively used a brute, brute force search algorithm. It looked for every single possible combination of moves. In this game, there are 10 to the 170 game states. And just to put that in perspective, there are only 10 to the 80 atoms in the observable universe. So trying to calculate every single position of every single piece in every single um, instance of the game is impossible. And so they had to use a lot of clever algorithms or machine learning algorithms to get this to work. So I'm not going to go too much into the details, but it uses a combination of search trees and deep neural networks. So we've seen examples of deep neural networks already. Effectively, it was trained on many, many moves, I think thousands of games from professional players, and it learned what good moves were in good, com in good situations. Um, it was then, once that had been trained, from the experts in the game, it then played itself for essentially days on end with many millions of games, getting better and better as it played itself. And then in March 2016, they brought it out in the public and it played Lisa Doll, who lost four games to one um, against this thing. And this is quite a big uh, hit at the time because Lisa Doll prided himself on this. And at the time, it was thought to be impossible to get a computer to play a game this complicated. Um, but I think it's a little bit unfair because Lisa Doll's one man sitting here and he's up against an enormous computer which has nearly 2,000 CPUs, an enormous um, group of GPUs. And so it's, it seems a bit unfair, but what's impressive here is that the game is so complicated it is not possible to calculate what the best move is. It is only possible to estimate what the best move is. And I recommend watching the documentary AlphaGo on Netflix because you get a sense of some of the moves that were played in this game were considered godlike, meaning that the chance of someone coming up with them was about 1 in 10,000. Um, AlphaGo then created AlphaGo Master, which beat the world champion three games to zero. He went on to say that humans have not even begun to touch the meaning of the game Go, because the computers at this point are so far ahead of where we thought this game could go. This game has been played for two and a half thousand years, and to have a computer come along in a matter of a year be able to play it better than any human could ever hope to play the game is quite uh, amazing, in my opinion. Um, unfortunately, Lisa Dole, who we saw on here, has now resigned. He's now retired, effectively saying that he can't really hack it anymore. Now he knows that he's not the best player or has no chance in being the best player. The same team, Google, went on to develop what's called Alpha Star. So for those who play StarCraft, um, Al uh, Google have now built an algorithm that can beat pretty much any player in the world at StarCraft. And it does this using the same constraints that a human has. It can only see the same part of the map a human has. It can only tap the keyboard as quick as a human can, and already it can beat 99.8% of players. So it's amazing how quickly these artificial intelligence systems are advancing. Another thing I want to talk about is GPT-2. I don't know if people have seen this 
in the news, but OpenAI, which is Elon Musk's artificial intelligent research company, has built an algorithm which essentially takes text input and then tries to guess or makes up what the next input is. So people are worried about this because it's a potential for fake news generation. Initially, it was considered too dangerous to actually release, but they did release a simplified model which only had one and a half billion parameters, which is apparently much less than the true size of the model. And it was trained on, I think, about most of the internet, which is 40 gigabytes of text. It's just text that it's trained on. And so I put into it what I was going to do this evening. So I'm giving a lecture. So this is in bold, the input. And then it quite cleverly put this as an output and said, anyone who's interested in the area of AI will come along and hear me speak, which is quite accurate. But then it quite quickly slips into fantasy. So uh, <laughs> this is certainly not true. And so you can see that although this algorithm is able to approximate human language, it's quite convincing in a way, the context, what it says, the facts, is not concerned with. And maybe that's, and people are worried about this in the context of journalism, maybe that says something about <laughs> Journalism, I don't know, but um, it's interesting to think that there could be articles out there on the internet written by a computer that a human has never created, and we might not be able to tell the difference. Um, here are some people, and so you look at these, and I don't know if you recognize any of these people. Does anyone recognize any of these people? Well, I'm glad no one put their hands up, because they're not real. Every single one of these people has been generated by a computer by something called a generative adversarial network. And how this works is, quite simply, we've got what's called a generator, and we've got what's called a discriminator. So this is trying to create a counterfeit human being, and this is trying to guess which ones are real and which ones are fake. And you train these up in tandem, so as this gets better, this has to get better. And so it iteratively improves itself until you've got the ability to create what look like real human beings, but in fact these people have never existed. You can use it to create, to take a, an image of your dog and create different breeds of your dog. So these dogs, again, have never existed. You can also take your dog and turn it into a cat, <laughs> uh, if you want, using the same approach. Uh, you can also take a zebra and turn it into a horse or vice versa. You can take a photograph and put it into uh, your favorite artist's style, if you like. Um, there are amazing things you can do with generative adversarial networks, but they are quite scary in a sense. And so I think it's important that people keep an eye on these technologies to look out for when weird things start happening in the media, for example. Um, I'm going to talk about something a little bit closer to home to me, <coughs> medical applications. So I'm going to talk about my project. So what do I work on? We take whole body MRI scans. In this case, we've got 500 what called whole body MRI scans. Um, I go through and segment all the bones out. We then get an algorithm to take these images and segment the bones automatically. We then get a computer algorithm, a deep learning network, to classify the disease in these bones, depending, so this means focal active, and maybe it's six to ten lesions in a bone. The specifics aren't important, but I'm, I'm currently working on a project where we're trying to use deep learning, artificial intelligence, essentially to um, improve with the diagnosis and staging of a disease called multiple myeloma. Um, we haven't got to the end stages yet, we don't have any results to report, but it's exciting research to work on. Some people who have got results. So dermatology, um, there is now an app you can get on your phone where you can take a picture of a mole and it can tell you whether that mole is likely to be malignant and if you should go to the GP because of it. Um, and so here are some pictures of moles and Effectively, this network, or this neural network, can classify them into benign or malignant. And the really cool thing about this is it is able to perform at the same level as a dermatologist. And so what this means is for people who don't have access to dermatologists, or who can't see a dermatologist quick enough, you can train an artificial intelligence system on the expert advice of a dermatologist, and then put that system on a mobile phone. And people can then use that all across the world. And for me, it's a very impressive thing because we have the ability to democratize healthcare. Another example is chest x-rays. So there's, there have been researchers who build a system which can detect pneumonia and 13 other uh, chest-related disorders uh, with the same accuracy as the average radiologist. 
So is this the end of radiologists? Is the end of doctors in general? So Geoffrey Hinton, who's one of the fathers of deep learning, a very impressive figure, um, said this back in October 2016, that it's completely obvious that these artificial intelligence systems are going to be better than radiologists in five years, and we should stop training them now. Now, I can tell you he wasn't right, and the next year he said this, and he said the role of the radiologist will evolve um, from doing things perceptual, which could probably be done by a highly trained pigeon, he's still got a little bit of a chip on his shoulder. <laughs> It's a far more common thing. And, and what the mistake he made there is he doesn't understand what a radiologist does. A radiologist doesn't just look at images. It's a complicated job where you interact with other medical professionals in a way to try and solve very complex problems. So computers might be good at simple image processing tasks, but they are not good currently at, say, liaising with a team of oncologists or surgeons um, to come up with a treatment plan. Okay, I'm going to talk very quickly about the future because I'm eating slightly into the question time here. Um, so, concerns <laughs> about AI. So, people are worried about mass unemployment. Um, this is a concern, and my current view on it is that, yes, artificial intelligence will likely cause a shift in the jobs humans do, but we have had technological improvements in, for hundreds of years that have affected jobs, and I don't see it being mass step change anytime soon. People are concerned about superintelligence, so this idea of a technological singularity. And what that means is computers or artificial intelligence get so advanced to the point where they can just improve, them, improve them themselves on their own, get better on their own. Um, and then we might run into questions about whether these artificial intelligence systems really have our best interests at heart. And so there are a lot of people working on this, and a lot of people who are truly concerned about the fact that we might get to a runaway situation. I'm slightly more sceptical, and I'll share my views in a little bit. People are worried about an AI arms race. You know, governments of countries trying to build and outcompete each other with more and more complex and superintelligent systems. People are concerned about autonomous weapons. Should we allow autonomous systems to have the ability to kill human beings? Um, and people are worried about data centralization. So this is actually one of the things that I think we can talk about a little bit directly is the fact that we all use Google and Facebook and we pour a lot of our private data into it. And we should be mindful of who has that data. There are several people, Elon Musk, Stephen Hawking, who have some fairly bleak outlooks. Um, although Stephen Hawking is a little bit more balanced, with he's either going to be the best or the worst, so uh, I guess we'll find <laughs> out. <laughs> you can't beat him, join him. Some people are talking about this idea of merging with machines, downloading your brain into computers. This is very far-fetched idea, but I thought I would mention it. People think it might be the next phase of evolution. We've gone through biological phases, going through digital, and the next phase of evolution is going to be bio-digital fusion. Uh, we are also entering the era of deep fakes. So here is actor Amy Adams, who I don't think you can tell, but that is not her face. That is yeah. Nicolas Cage um, being mapped up. And people are worried about deep fakes, especially if we've got an election coming up. We haven't had any issue with that in this country, but maybe in the US people are going to start creating videos of people saying things they didn't really say. There are techniques to tackle this, but um, the better people get at faking them, the harder it becomes to detect these fakes, and it is a bit of an arms race. So I've blown through a lot of very important issues there very quickly. So I'm just going to give what I think. So here's prognosis. Well, what is it worth? I'm going to tell you what I think is going to happen. So I think AI is going to drastically change the way we live our lives, but I honestly believe it's going to be for the better. I think it will allow us to focus on more meaningful things and take away a lot of effort from the mundane and repetitive tasks that some people do. Um, artificial general intelligence, this idea of having a computer with the same general intelligence of a human is a long way off, and I don't think we know how to get there. I think we're making a lot of assumptions that we think the models we have currently, which are described as narrow AIs, which are good at specific narrow tasks, if we can take those models and generalize them to general intelligence. I don't think it's going to happen. I think we're entering a hype bubble. So this is Gartner's hype cycle, and this is deep learning, and I think we're about to reach the peak of inflated expectations, and at some point we're going to go to the trough of disillusionment. <laughs> when people realize that while these methods are impressive, we're not going to get to general artificial intelligence anytime soon. Um, data is power, so take care of your own data. 
I recommend to everyone to download all their data from Google or Facebook because of GDPR, you now have the ability to request all of your data from Google. And you can download your data from Google and see what they think about you. They have classified you based on your browsing habits, whether they think you're male or female, what your sexuality is, your approximate age, where you might live, based on your browsing habits. So I recommend to take control of your own data and bear in mind how you use the internet. Um, regulation and ethics need to catch up. Governments are taking uh, heed of this, but currently there's not too much effort going in to regulate these systems. Um, I could be wrong with all these predictions, by the way. Maybe artificial general intelligence is just around the corner. Uh, I don't think so, but maybe. Uh, I'm going to finish very quickly by saying I welcome everyone to join the AI revolution. It has never been easier to do programming. So here is Python. So I don't know if they teach it in school. I hope they do. They should. You certainly teach, get to learn at a university. And here's all these different packages you can use for machine learning. And it's never been easier to learn online. You can log on to any one of these websites, pay 10 quid for a course, and learn about machine learning or programming. Okay, that is the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening, and feel free to send me an email if you have any questions which are not answered. Thank you very much indeed. So, time for questions. Um, yeah, please. Okay, yeah. Derek. Um, do you think that these AI systems will develop a sense of wonder and get to the point of asking why, and therefore perhaps evolving a sense of purpose for themselves? Um, that's a good question. So, a sense of purpose, I think, derives from having an objective or having some sort of meaning. Um, and in the case of programming computers, we in general program that it objective, we give it a goal. I think if you look at us as biological systems, we've been programmed with the objective of staying alive, and that gives us purpose and meaning. Um, I see no reason immediately why a computer would be concerned with, say, its own mortality, but it's not impossible to program it to care about its own existence. Um, so I think, to answer your question, um, if you wanted a system to have meaning and purpose, you'd need to program it to do so. I don't think it would necessarily spontaneously arise in a complex system. Okay. <laughs> Difficult question there. Is that I think the youngsters are going to ask a question. There's no stupid questions. Go on. Each part of the system yeah. will develop over time at different rates, i.e. the sensors will be developing at one rate. The central computers, quantum computers, all developing at different rates. Mm. Which part of the system do you see as developing at the slowest rate and slowing the whole system down? At the moment, I think access to data is one of the biggest is bottlenecks. So, particularly the sector I work in, um, medicine, you know, medical imaging, it's incredibly difficult to get large data sets. So. You may have seen on the slide about my project, we're looking at a data set of 500 whole body scans. Um, ideally, we'd want tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of these scans, but getting access to large data sets is very difficult, particularly in medical areas. Um, when it comes to development of the technology of machine learning, it's happening at an incredible pace, and that's, a lot of that's thanks to the fact that people are now working in very open source environments. So, what I find very impressive about computer science and machine learning is that people are working open source, so they're collaborating openly with each other. So that part's advancing very quickly. Um, it's interesting you mentioned quantum, because I think if we are to reach any sort of general intelligence, we might actually start needing to use quantum computers to do that, because I'm not convinced we can get the basic um, silicon computers. Uh, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, can you give some idea, you talked about 1920 computers, so yeah. many GPUs, mm. you said that uh, we take an input and put a weight on it, yeah. and this math, so how many, how many um, axioms are yeah. there, in, and how many stages in these neural networks are there? Sure, so 
if you consider simple image classification. So, for example, a few weeks ago, I built a simple convolutional neural network to tell the difference between cats and dogs. And it had about seven layers of neurons, and each layer of neurons, there were about 400 neurons in each layer. And so that gives you about two to 300,000 what we call trainable parameters, which are the weights. And to train that algorithm accurately, to tell the difference between a cat and a dog, with an accuracy rate of 90%, it took about two hours of training. <coughs> Um, comparatively, some of the examples I showed you, for example that video game, StarCraft, uh, it took 40 days of training for it to get to the state where it could compete with the average human being. And in that case, you were talking billions of trainable parameters with hundreds of layers and you know, tens of thousands of neurons. So it's exploded recently. If you went back 10, 15 years, you would be talking about only a few hundred neurons. But now, because of computing power, you're talking tens of thousands of neurons and hundreds of thousands, if not millions or billions, of weights that can be trained. Presumably, uh, iterates. it iterates. So, so what you do is you pass through normally batches of examples. So if we're taking the image classification. You give it an example of a picture of a dog you would propagate that through the network, so you would see what result you get at the end, and maybe it classifies it incorrectly, it classifies it as a, as a cat. We put in a picture of a dog, asked it to classify it, we've got a cat. We say, no, that's wrong. We then calculate in a very approximate way what the difference between a cat and a dog is, and you propagate that difference back through the network and update the weights on each layer accordingly. Um, and you do that many, many times, so it might require 10 million images to pass through the network and update the weights until you reach a point where it's considered trained. Okay. Yeah. Can I just jump to the back? One of the young students. Sure. Yeah. 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 I know you might be biased considering your work in the area, yeah. but how important do you think artificial intelligence is um, in the grand scheme of things compared to other technological advancements, including electrical engineering, space travel, etc.? Um, in isolation, artificial intelligence wouldn't be very useful at all. If without the sensors to take images of things, without the instruments to collect data, it would all be fairly meaningless. So um, I think it complements these other areas. I think if you're comparing it to space travel, um, I don't know if they use machine learning in space travel. I'm personally very excited by the idea of going back to the moon or going to Mars. I wouldn't directly compare these two things. I think they're very different. Uh, How important do you think they will be in the future? Artificial intelligence. Yeah. Um, I think increasingly so, although less than a lot of people are currently claiming. I know that's a very vague answer, but um, I think people are expecting in 10 years that we will have a computer that is as intelligent as a human. I think it's more like 100 years, but even then, guessing is impossible. I think we're going to see machine learning move into more and more aspects of our life. I think the days of picking up a phone and talking to a human being, or the days of um, people working in secretarial jobs, I get unnumbered. And I think in five, ten years, we'll probably have systems which do a lot of the tasks which uh, are currently done by humans. But I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it just means that we'll be able to do more interesting things. Okay. Jeff, yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot of us are electrical and electronic engineers. Mm. Some of us have spent time in software. Can you comment on what the machine looks like? I mean, I can imagine you have a neural chip, but you must have things oh, okay. that surround it to make it do things. Sure, I mean, essentially it all runs on a computer. I, I can do machine learning right here on my laptop. Right. And, and all it is is an algorithm that runs on a computer. And so inside the computer you have a CPU and a GPU, um, and you use it the same way you'd use it normally. It's just a different algorithm. So, but, but to, they do have specifically made what are called tensor cores, um, but those mostly aren't used. Um, it's mainly in the research stage. It's just normal CPUs and GPUs that are used. Um, but who knows, maybe in the future we'll have biological neural networks that run on a chip. I'm not sure. Um, if, for instance, you would use a FPGA, mm -hmm to run your own neural net, mm -hmm. and so you could, using FPGAs, you can modify the FPGA as, it, as you go along. Yeah. And if you combine that with <coughs> algorithms, mm. if you've got a situation like you've got your 
your Mars rover, it's never been to Mars before, has it? Mm. So it's going to have to have a, a system like that, maybe including deep learning as well. Mm. Yeah, so if FPGAs, I don't believe they use them currently in um, machine learning. I don't know why. Um, I think the, the general, so for those wondering, FPGAs are field programmable gate arrays, which are programmable processing chips where you can change, I believe you can change the internal architecture to make it uh, more efficient at certain tasks. But graphics cards today are incredibly good at doing the maths that we need in deep learning. Um, so I don't think they use FPGAs for that. Um, <coughs> yeah. Okay. So the question. So you mind, uh, uh, You mentioned yeah. a different different types of uh, machine learning uh, strategies, um, yeah. like re reinforcement learning. Yeah. Which strategies are you think are <coughs> most accurate or have the sort of biggest future? Uh, they all they all have different domains. So what I work in convolutional neural networks is good at looking at images. Reinforcement learning is good when you um, have a game, for example, or an agent, as we call it, operating in a particular environment. And if it does something which is bad, then you negatively um, you know, give it a negative reward. And if it does something good, you give it a positive reward. Um, and that's good for, say, getting a robotic hand to, um, for example, Google's recently used a robotic hand to um, solve a Rubik's Cube. And that's a very dexterous task. And that uses reinforcement learning. Um, yeah, so, there's, so there are many different applications, and so there's no one algorithm that's going to prove to be the best. Uh, but at the heart of all of them tends to be the basic idea of an artificial neuron. Um, so I think that's a sort of common okay. theme. Two more questions before we get to food time. Can I go with it? Yeah. <clears throat> In very general terms, the processing that I'm familiar with is all done by microscopic uh, solid state materials. Mm -hmm. Looking at the brain, that appears, in my terms, to be electrochemical. Yeah. Is there at any time going to be a transition from the one to the other? I don't know, but it's an interesting question because this is a slightly slight tangent to your point, but um, in terms of approximating how a brain works, it would require an enormous amount of computational power to simulate every single molecule inside the brain because, as you said, the brain isn't a um, physical thing in terms of silicon chips. It's a bio biological or chemical thing. Um, and order to, we're currently not at the stage where we can accurately simulate, say, a hundred neurons, biological neurons, because of the complexity of the net. Is there a stage in which we might start using biological neurons for computation? <coughs> Possibly. I think that's a long way off. Um, we can grow neurons in controlled conditions and cell culture environments, uh, but we currently don't have a very good way to interface with biology. Um, we can't put in signals, expect it to compute something and get a result. So I think for us to start using biological neurons for this sort of stuff, uh, we're going to have to understand more about how they work. Um, yeah. Okay, one more. Just to Back on. <laughs> you have time for questions. Got gentlemen right at the back. Yeah. Um, when I, when you have a um, uh, an application which requires a, a neural network, mm. um, will you always improve the efficiency by increasing the number of hidden layers, or does it come to a point where, sort of, even if you put in more, you, you just don't get any better results? So the answer is, if you, it's not always. So if you if you start increasing the complexity, sometimes you get what's called overfitting. So um, if you imagine you're trying to fit a line through a set of points on a plot uh, and maybe the, all the points line up in a fairly straight line and you're using some very high order polynomial with loads of terms in it, you're going to get a very wiggly line through all those points. And actually when you introduce a new point and you try and figure out whether it fits on that line or not, you've overfit that data. And so as you increase the complexity of these things, you don't always get better performance. And, in machine learning in general, or neural networks in general, it's a bit of an art to figure out how many layers you need, because more is not always better. Um, and the more layers you have, the more time it takes to train, and the more examples you need to train it. Um, so 
in general, you need to find sort of a sweet spot between the complexity of um, the problem you're trying to solve uh, and the complexity of the neural network. And is that also the same for the number of uh, neurons per layer? Uh, so it depends. So if normally with, say, for example, convolution neural networks, the input layer is the same size as the number of pixels you have that you're putting in. Um, and then you'll normally go down to about half of that. But again, it's, it, it's a lot of the time it's trial and error. Um, but it's a similar thing that if you have much, much wider layers, um, you're going to run into similar problems of overfitting and under-training. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. We'll pause there. You can come down and ask your questions, but I need to get a glass of wine, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, Theo, thank you very much indeed for a yeah. fascinating presentation.